Galicia is a region in western Ukraine, and it used to be one of the most contested and most culturally diverse regions in all of Europe. This is clearly reflected in the name of the region's largest city, Lviv, or Lvov, or Lemberg, or Lvov, or Lemberik, or Leopold, I think you get the idea. The city was home to a very large Jewish population, which in 1910 accounted for about 30% of the city's inhabitants. Unfortunately, as the First World War drew to an end, the tensions between the various different ethnic groups escalated and climaxed into one of the most devastating acts of anti-Semitic violence in the early 20th century. This is the story of the Lwów pogrom. Lwów had been a city inside the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth for centuries before Austrian troops occupied it and turned it into the capital of their new crown land, Galicia Lodomeria, in 1772. At that point in time, the city was a mere shadow of its former self. The Polish nobility, the Schlachter, did everything in its power to diminish the political power of the city and the burghers, and on top of that, the city had fallen victim to many wars, plunderers and bribes. So, in the later half of the 18th century, Lwów had a population of a bit over 20,000. Of these 20,000, the majority were Poles, followed by Ukrainians and Jews, with tiny sprinkles of German and Armenian families. But as Austrian rule progressed, more and more people began to move to the city. It became an important centre of trade in the trade route between Vienna, Odessa and Yash. Although the official language in Lwów was German, the city soon became a sort of hub for Polish nationalists who met up in theatres, coffee houses or in casinos. In order to please the Poles, Vienna assigned two professorships to Polish teachers and allowed the construction of the Ossolineum, a national library or research institute of sorts. However, the Ukrainians also played an important role in the city. Sticking to its divide-and-conquer policy, the Austrians granted the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church various privileges. After Austria's military defeat in the 1860s, Vienna was forced to make concessions to its national minorities. Polish and Ukrainian became official languages, as well as German. In October of 1870, Lwów was granted the status of an autonomous city, and the Polish majority began to rename many streets to give the city a more Polish flair. New Street became Sobieski Street, and Frendelowska became Kopernika Street. On top of that, Polish became the main language in schools and in public offices. Complaints from the Ukrainian side fell on largely deaf ears. During the years leading up to the war, the tensions between Poles and Ukrainians often escalated into violence, with mass brawls, assassinations and violent demonstrations. Now, let's look at the third largest group in Galicia, the Jews. A Russian traveller passing through Galicia is reported to have said, Jews everywhere, and no matter where I look, I am in the kingdom of Jews. It seems that nothing runs here without them. In total, Jews made up about 12% of the Galician population, with most of them living in urban areas. A proportionally big number of them managed to become wealthy and live their lives as lawyers, architects, doctors, but the absolute majority of Jews lived in abject poverty. Before the turn of the 20th century, rivalries between Jews and Ukrainians and Poles were largely confined to economic competition, but as soon as the industrialization of Austria progressed further, Polish political groups began to use anti-Semitism as a tool to further their cause. You see, the Schlachta were hit especially hard by the rapidly changing economy and tried to establish themselves in a local commerce and industry, and those were largely dominated by Jewish traders and manufacturers. Then you also had the national issue. After having realised the pointlessness of armed resistance, Polish intellectuals and political activists began to promote the idea of organic work, which essentially included peaceful political participation with the hopes of creating a better life for the Poles through reforms. Initially, Jews were considered to be an important ally to the Polish courts, and many members of the Jewish intelligentsia supported closer integration into Polish society. However, the vast majority of Jews sympathised with the central government in Vienna and with German slash Austrian culture and education. In response to the whole situation, the Polish Narodowa Demokracja movement, or the Index, argued that the truly ethnic Poles should unite and exclude Jews, who in their eyes were nothing more than German proxies, who just so happened to speak Polish. The many Jewish refugees from Russia in the 1880s only added more xenophobic fuel to the fire. The Polish Catholic press missed absolutely no second to revitalise the myth of the Jewish ritual murder and began a smear campaign to spread as much fear as they possibly could. 
In 1898, many towns such as Vielichka, Kalvaria and Nova Sanj witnessed violent attacks on Jewish inhabitants. Those attacks were not supported by the majority of Polish political parties, but that didn't stop further excesses from occurring anyway. In 1907 and 1911, the index stressed the supposedly treacherous characteristics when Jews in Galicia largely voted in favour of Ukrainian and Jewish candidates for the Imperial Council. Ukrainian intellectuals also lost no opportunity to claim that the Jews were fraudulent profiteers, determined to destroy the Galician economy, but at the same time recognised the plight of the Jewish lower class and pushed for the recognition of Yiddish as an official language. So, in the early 1910s, the Jewish population had ended up between hammer and anvil, so to speak, with both Ukrainians and Poles considering Jews to be a foreign and hostile element. However, none of the anti-Semitic parties managed to gain a massive follower base, and as long as Austria managed to keep the peace and order intact, the outbursts of violence remained quite rare. But that all changed when the war between Austria and Russia broke out. On the 3rd of September 1914, Russian troops occupied Lvov and the rest of Galicia, a region the Tsarist government was very interested in. For the Jewish population, this was horrible news, as pre-World War I Russia could easily be classified as the most anti-Semitic country in the world. In the preceding decades, pogroms had swept across the country and anti-Semitic propaganda dominated the Russian press spreading the fear of the ritual murderer, the killer of Christ and the international banker eager for world domination. Those views were also dominant in the military and Jewish soldiers were often viewed with suspicion. As soon as the Austrian army evacuated the area and Russian soldiers occupied it, the violence began. Hundreds of Jewish houses were either looted or burnt. Many perpetrators believed that they were on a sort of crusade to free Galicia from the Jewish yoke, or that the Jews were conspiring with the German and Austrian governments. One of the worst outbursts of violence occurred in Wolf on the 26th of September 1914, when mysteriously shots were fired from somewhere within the city centre. In the ensuing panic, many people were wounded and quickly the rumour spread that it had been a Jew who fired the shots. Quickly, Russian soldiers rushed to Krakow Square and into the Jewish quarters and opened fire. At night, the soldiers cordoned off the streets inside the Jewish quarters and, accompanied by a mob, broke into Jewish houses, looted their possessions, shot or beat up whoever they wanted, and left their lifeless bodies on the street, regardless of age and gender. In total, about 20 to 50 people lost their lives during that day. On top of all the violence, thousands of Jews were deported away from their homes after their properties had been confiscated. However, neither the Russian army nor the Tsarist government waged a war of extermination. Russian public opinion largely denounced what was happening in Galicia, and even prominent anti-Semitics criticised the inhumane treatment of Jews. There are even reports of some officers who treated all ethnic groups on an equal basis and protected the Jews against outbursts from their troops. As is well known, the Russian occupation of Galicia didn't last forever, and in June of 1915, Austrian troops took back Wolf. But it left the Jewish-Polish relations in a disastrous state. During the wave of violence in 1914, Poles and Ukrainians were encouraged to participate in the lootings, and Polish officials often extorted wealthy Jews. On top of that, because of the deportations, about 80,000 Jewish refugees found themselves in Warsaw under terrible conditions. You can imagine that the Endek press exploited this situation to spread their hateful press campaign. Aleksander Świętochowski, a well-known Polish activist, wrote an article called Wojna Czyjeszcza Czwarta, in which he claimed that the Jews were planning on creating an autonomous Jewish enclave inside of Poland, and that the Polish nation could not possibly survive with this conspiratory and disloyal ethnic minority. When the Austrians and the Germans reoccupied Galicia, they were largely welcomed by the Jews, who hoped that the pre-war order would be restored, and that they could finally live in peace again. And indeed, the German military allowed Jewish organisations to continue their activities and restored their civil rights. The Poles, however, experienced something different. As the war progressed, the Central Powers began to exploit the Polish territories more and more. Forests were cut down, food was redistributed away from Poland and Polish people were forced to work in German arms factories. The Austrians forced Polish and Ukrainian peasants to return the Jewish property they had stolen during the Russian occupation. Additionally, it became clear that the Central Powers had absolutely no intention of ever seriously bringing back an independent Polish state. 
As a result, Polish anti-Jewish sentiments only grew when the Jews openly welcomed and supported the Germans slash Austrians. With this rise of animosity, some prominent Endeg activists, such as Roman Dmowski, claimed that it was impossible to assimilate Jewish people into the reborn Polish state and that Ocidzanie, essentially forced mass immigration, was the only possible solution. In 1918, the situation was especially dire as factors such as hunger and the desire for peace grew ever larger. When the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed, many Poles felt anger over the fact that the historically Polish Helm province was given to Ukraine in exchange for grain. Quickly, violent riots against the pro-German Jews broke out in Kraków and Lwów, and in Warsaw, the index called for a boycott of Jewish shops. The Austrian troops were only barely able to keep the peace, and in summer of 1918, the collapse of the empire seemed almost inevitable. To avoid disaster, the Jews hoped to ally themselves with the Ukrainians. The Ukrainian national movement had gained quite a bit of progress during the war, and in October of 1918, the National Council was founded with Yevhen Petrushevich at its head. The council claimed full authority over all the ethnically Ukrainian lands within Austria-Hungary, and recognised the Jews as a distinct and equal nationality. Of course, Polish nationalists could not allow Galicia to fall into Ukrainian hands, and in Lwów, Józef Piłsudski's Polska Organizacja Wojskowa subordinated themselves to an Endek war veteran called Czesław Monczynski. But they weren't fast enough. On the 1st of November, Ukrainian troops occupied Lwów and the West Ukrainian People's Republic was proclaimed. Lwów's majority Polish population was not pleased about that, and quickly many people, regardless of age and gender, organised themselves in armed resistance to bring the city under the Polish eagle. The Jews proclaimed their neutrality and formed a militia to protect the Jewish quarters. This triggered a wave of outrage among the Poles, who viewed this act of neutrality as a direct stab in the back against the Polish civilization in favour of the seemingly uneducated Ukrainians from the countryside. Of course, this was no betrayal in any way, as directly allying yourself with one group would obviously be a terrible idea with serious repercussions, so most Jews just wanted to wait out the storm. On the 21st of November, Polish forces started an offensive and just one day later, after a bit of fighting, Lwów was under Polish control. Immediately, the violence against the Jewish traitors began. A mob of undisciplined and probably drunken soldiers, joined by civilians and escaped prisoners, entered the Jewish quarters and in a time span of 48 hours, did whatever they wanted. They smashed windows, broke into other people's houses, murdered Jews on sight, raped women, chanted anti-Semitic slogans, tossed grenades into buildings and torn down walls. They did all of this in waves so that it seemed like an organised attack. After two days of sheer inhumanity, three synagogues were set on fire and anywhere between 73 and 150 people were dead. The mob did all of this while genuinely believing that they were given two days by the Polish military command to plunder the city, but such an order was never given. It was merely a rumour that happened to spread everywhere. Then again, the Polish command also made very little effort to stop the violence. The chief of staff, Antoni Jakubski, is supposed to have said the following to a Jewish delegation protesting against the violence. It is a punitive expedition into the Jewish quarter, which cannot be stopped. Upon hearing Jewish deputies, Czesław Monczynski promised that he would stop the violence, but he only issued that order on the following day, on November 23rd, later claiming that the publisher was late with printing it. What's more is that the riots were even expected to happen, as General Bolesław Roya had requested reinforcements from Kraków to uphold the law. But it was only on the 24th of November that the Polish gendarmerie managed to restore order in Lwów, even though they could definitely have stopped the violence even earlier, if they had wanted to. Something like that happened in Przemysl on the 11th of November, where the local Polish commander immediately put down an anti-Jewish mob after the city had been recaptured from the Ukrainians. But it seemed that there was a lack of motivation to do the same in Lwów. This was, by far, not the worst action of anti-Jewish violence that occurred in the early 20th century. Just look at Russia. But the international outrage was huge. During the war, the Polish national movement had gained massive amounts of sympathy abroad, especially because it promised that it would create a democratic and humane modern state. Many outside observers were disappointed by the happenings in Lwów and the reputation of the young Polish nation was badly damaged. The Manchester Guardian wrote, 
This was one of the worst pogroms in Polish history, and the device of the old Polish oligarchy to counter the new democratic tendencies. In many other newspapers, the death numbers were widely exaggerated, and some claimed that 1,600 people were killed, which is false. Politicians in France, Britain and America urged for sanctions against Poland. The Polish press tried its best to detach the blame from their own countrymen. They claimed that the majority of rioters were Ukrainians, or that the Jews themselves incited the pogrom. The central government officially condemned the violence but wrote the pogrom off as an inevitable act of war. Anti-Semitic slogans were shouted in Poland's streets, and rumours about Jews allying themselves with communist Russia became rather popular. Of course, you also had some members from the Polish aristocracy, the Lwów city council and the government, who genuinely decided to help by donating vast sums of money to the victims. Some of the perpetrators in the mob were later tried and charged with imprisonment. Still, Polish-Jewish relations were strained from the very conception of the new Republic of Poland and would never seriously recover. Still, as part of the Treaty of Versailles and as part of the March Constitution, Jews in Poland were granted religious freedom and religious holidays. Alright, thank you very much for watching the video until the end. I have to especially thank A Cup of Tea, James and Felix for their support on Ko-Fi, which I am really grateful for. Anyway, have a good day and see you next time.